Good morning and welcome to our Office for Students registration webinar. I'm Becca Jackson and I work in the registration team. I'm joined today by some of my colleagues, Jack Smith, who will be co-presenting co the webinar with me, and Anna Kubik and Jess Turner, who will be monitoring any questions that you submit to us. This webinar is a rerun of material presented at our recent registration events. These were held in London and Manchester last month. If you attended these events, you have already heard this material, but please feel free to keep listening if you would like a recap. Just to let you know, we will also make a recording of today's webinar available so that this can be viewed at a later date. Today, we will be focusing on the overarching registration process, and whilst we will briefly touch upon access and participation plans, we won't be going into this aspect of the registration process in detail. We would encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the ask a question function and we'll be pausing periodically to answer these. As we do have some time constraints today though, we would just ask that you focus on questions related to the registration process. We'll start today by providing some introductory background information to the Office for Students and set the scene for why and how you can register with the RFS. We will then go through the initial conditions of registration one by one explaining what evidence you'll be required to submit and how this will be dependent upon your individual circumstances. Finally, we'll explain briefly how we will be assessing your application and the timescales that we will be working to. Before we get started, I just wanted to highlight the new Office for Students website. This is where you will find all the documents we'll be referring to today and we've included the link on our slides for information. Just to let you know that we've added a new section today called Help and Advice, which is where you'll find some of the resources that we'll discuss later. I'm going to start with some scene setting. For anyone who hasn't seen it, we launched the regulatory framework on the 28th of February 2018, which sets out the regulatory approach for the RFS. The Office for Students is the new regulator for higher education in England. It was established on the 1st of January 2018 under the Higher Education and Research Act 2017. This enabled the establishment of the RFS Board and the publication of the framework and guidance ahead of the organisation being fully operational. We officially opened our doors for the RFS this week on the 3rd of April. The framework sets out how we intend to perform our various functions and provides guidance on the ongoing conditions of registration. It will become fully operational on the 1st of August 2019. Until this time, there will be a transition period where we will operate with some of HEFKE and OFFA's powers that have been carried forward alongside some of the new powers under the HCM Research Act. The regulatory framework is available on our website and although a lengthy document, we would advise that you read this if you haven't done so already. In today's webinar, we will primarily be discussing the OFS's role in relation to provider level regulation, but we thought it was helpful to briefly touch upon how we will regulate at the sector level as well. Our main objective is to ensure that English HE is delivering positive outcomes to students, past, present and future. We will seek to ensure that students from all backgrounds, particularly the most disadvantaged, can access, succeed in and progress from higher education. So at the sector level, we will focus on creating the conditions for informed choice, competition and continuous improvement. The regulatory framework is designed to mitigate the risk to students and ensure that this objective can be met. We are a principles-based regulator, taking a different approach to previous regulation. Our regulatory approach sets baseline requirements, articulated through the initial conditions. These set a high standard which providers must pass and which, which must pass and which are designed to have a focus on protecting students and the public. We think we can regulate the baseline, but we can't regulate for innovation. So beyond that baseline, we will allow space for the sector to we will allow space to enable the sector to innovate and diversify. It is important to note that our focus will be on outcomes, not processes, allowing institutions to act with autonomy to determine the best approaches to sec secure successful outcomes for their students. Lastly, as outlined on the slide, there will be a single register so students will know the minimum baseline of provision that they can expect every single re register provider to deliver and providers will compete on a level playing field.
Moving on now to provider level regulation. At the provider level, the OFS will regulate and intervene where necessary to protect the interests of all students. As previously mentioned, to register with us, all providers must demonstrate that they satisfy a set of initial conditions of registration. This will ensure that they are able to offer high quality higher education to its students. We'll be discussing these in our approach to risk assessment in further detail shortly. The OFS will regulate in a proportionate and targeted way. This means that provision, provision that presents low risk to students will be subject to less regulatory burden, while less secure elements of provision will face greater regulatory scrutiny. There will be no, no cyclical reviews, but the use of data in the form of lead indicators and other flags, for example, such as reportable events and whistleblowing, will trigger us to ask questions and, if necessary, take action. If you were at either of our recent events, you will have heard colleagues provide an important message. That is, we are not here to try and catch you out. Our starting assumption is that you are all honest triers. This is new and we recognise that some of you won't always get it right and we won't come down on hard on you where honest mistakes are made. However, interventions are available where there are serious and willful breaches. That has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the overview and an overview of the regulatory approach of the OFS, but I'll now hand over to Jack, who will talk you through in further detail the registration process. Good morning. My name is Jack Smith, and I'm going to talk to you about the registration process itself and the initial conditions that you will need to meet. I'll describe the evidence that you'll need to submit, which will vary depending on your particular circumstances. The areas I'm going to cover today are who can register, why should you register, the categories and conditions of registration, and what evidence you need to give us for each of the conditions. At the end of this section, I'll also provide a brief update on the changes to degree awarding power. We've published advice on what you need to do to register. This is available on our website, which is on this slide, and um, the link to the documents is on the bottom of every slide that you'll see today. These set out the full detail of what we'll talk about today. We strongly encourage anyone responsible for submitting an application to read these documents in full. There are two sets of advice, one for current providers and one for new providers. Our definition of new and existing providers is based on whether you've previously been regulated by HEFKE or the Department for Education. We consider providers that were previously HEFKE funded, so either higher education institutions or further education colleges, or that had courses designated by the Department for Education for student support, previously known as alternative providers. If you do not fit into either of those categories, we consider you, for the purposes of this application, to be a new provider as we will not have any access to previous information about you. This applies even if you have been established for a long time. I'll talk through both sets of guidance today and we'll let you know which parts of the presentation apply to each category. Firstly, who can register with the OFS? To be eligible to register, you must be or, attend, or intend to become an English higher education provider. When deciding whether you are eligible, we will consider whether your activities are prim primarily based in England, whether you deliver higher education courses, and whether the applying body is an institution. We expect the vast majority of existing providers to be eligible. If you are unsure about whether you are eligible, please refer to the advice on applying and get in touch with us to discuss. There are two main groups of existing providers that are not required to register. Providers in a subcontractual or franchise only relationship do not need to register unless you're required to do so by the Home Office for Tier 4 license purposes. Guidance on Tier 4 license purposes was published yesterday by the Home Office. We'll be placing a link to this on our website. School centred initial teacher training providers also do not need to register. Why should you register? There are a number of benefits of registration. You'll need to register with the OFS if you want to receive any of the following benefits. Whether you're officially recognized as providing higher education in England, 
to be able to access public grant funding from the OFS or from UKRI, to access the student support system for eligible undergraduate and postgraduate courses, to maintain or make an application to the Home Office to recruit international students with a Tier 4 sponsorship licence, and whether if you want to apply for degree awarding powers or university title. And what are the consequences if you choose not to register with the OFS? From 1920, any of your students, none of your students will be able to access student loans. You as a provider will not be able to access public grant funding or renew your Tier 4 licence. If you choose not to register and your students currently receive student loans, then we will put in place mechanisms to allow your continuing students to access student support for the remainder of their course, but none of your new students will have access. We're going to pause at this point for any questions that have come in so far. Anna and Jess are going to read out some of the questions that have been coming in. Anna, Jess, do we have anything that we want to cover? No, so far we haven't got any questions on that section of the presentation. Great. Well, throughout the webinar, we will be pausing for breaks, and Anna and Jess are busily monitoring any questions that come in here. So please do ask a question whenever you have one and we'll pick those up at a later stage in the presentation. Before that break, I set out the benefits of registration. There are two categories of registration, and each has different access to particular benefits. You can choose which category to register in. I'll run through the benefits of each in turn, but we'll leave this slide up so you can compare the two. The first category is approved fee cap. You should apply in this category if you want to access the following benefits. You'll be officially recognised as a provider of higher education. The fees you can charge will be capped. If you choose to apply for an access and participation plan, your fees will be capped at the higher amount, which is 9000 or 9250 if you have a TEF award. If you do not intend to charge over the basic amount, which is 6000 or 6165 if you do not have a, if you have a TEF award, then you will need to have an access and participation statement. As an approved fee cap provider, your eligible students will be able to access tuition fee loans up to your fee cap. So that's the basic or higher amount, depending on the fees you intend to charge. Your eligible postgraduate students will be able to access student support, and any eligible students will be able to access the disabled students allowance. If you apply for the approved fee cap category, you'll be eligible to receive public grant funding from the OFS and from UK Research and Innovation, the funding for which is dis distributed by Research England. You'll also be automatically eligible for Research Council funding. As an approved FECAP provider, you will also be eligible to apply for a Tier 4 sponsorship licence, subject to the Home Office rules I just mentioned, and to apply for degree awarding powers and university title. The second category is called Approved. You should apply in this category if you want to access the following benefits. You will also be officially recognised as a provider of higher education in England, but the fees that you can charge will not be capped. As an approved provider, your eligible students will be able to access tuition fee loans up to the basic amount. So for example, if you charge £12,000 a year, your students would be able to access £6,165 if you had a TEF award, and they would need to fund the remainder of their fees through a different source. As an approved provider, you would have your eligible postgraduate students would be able to access student support, and any eligible students could access the disabled student's allowance. If you apply as an approved provider, you will not be eligible to receive public grant funding from the OFS or from UK Research and Innovation. You may be eligible to apply for Research Council funding, but this will be subject to a separate application process run by UKRI. As an approved provider, you will also be eligible to apply for Tier 4 sponsorship licence and for degree awarding powers and university title. We've just put up on screen a table of the undergraduate fees for reference if you're a new provider or a provider that currently has course designation and is considering applying for the approved fee cap category. You'll see these um, fee limits vary depending on the type of course and whether it's full-time or part-time.
This section of the webinar will look at the initial conditions of registration that you will need to meet to be registered. For those of you who've read the regulatory framework, you'll know that there are a large number of ongoing conditions. These do not need to be met at the point of registration, so we'll focus only on those conditions that you need to meet when registering. These are organised into five categories. Access and participation, quality and standards, student protection, financial viability and sustainability, and good governance. In the slides that follow, I'll be going into further detail of the evidence that you will need to provide to demonstrate that you meet these conditions. We won't have time here to go through the detail of what each condition covers. If you need further detail, you can read about every single one of the conditions in the regulatory framework that's available from our website. If you do have any questions about the conditions, then please do get in touch with us and we'll be happy to discuss them. The evidence that existing and new providers will need to supply is different. This slide applies to existing providers, and just to remind you that this means those providers that were previously heavily funded or had courses designated for student support. For existing providers, we will use the existing evidence we hold to assess you in the areas of quality and standards, financial and financial viability and sustainability. There will be some providers where we'll require updated financial information, but we'll cover this in a little more detail in a later slide. For the remaining areas of the application, you'll need to submit new evidence. Again, we'll be looking at these areas in more detail through the rest of the presentation. For new providers, as we do not currently hold any information that we can draw upon, we will need you to provide evidence for all of the initial conditions. So now we'll look in detail, in more detail at the conditions. I'll start with the A conditions that relate to access and participation. If you're applying in the approved fee cap category and you intend to charge fees above the basic amount, you will need to provide an access and participation plan. So what is an access and participation plan? It's a document that sets out in detail how your provider will improve equality of opportunity for underrepresented groups to access, succeed in, and progress from higher education. It also needs to be ambitious, evidence-led, credible, and sufficiently resourced, and the plan should secure continuous improvement in your outcomes for underrepresented groups. If you're a provider delivering higher education through a subcontractual arrangement, you do not need to produce your own access and participation plan but your lead provider must name you in its own plan to ensure that the condition that applies to you can be satisfied. All access and participation plans must be approved by Chris Millwood, the Director for Fair Access and Participation. He has published guidance on what you need to include in an access and participation plan. You can find this and the details of all the other support available in relation to access and participation plans on our website. So if you're applying in either the approved fee cap category, but only charge fees up to the basic amount, or you're applying in the approved category, you will need to provide an access and participation statement. An access and participation statement is a document that is informed by your context that sets out your commitment to supporting access and participation in higher education by students from underrepresented groups, and that is publicly available and published on your website. However, this, this statement does not need to be approved by the Director for Access and Participation. Chris has, however, published advice on what might be included in an effective statement to help you. This document is available on the OFS website. Finally, on conditions A1 and A2, if you're a postgraduate only provider, that means you're not offering any qualifying undergraduate courses then you do not need to prepare an access and participation plan or statement. There's full details of whether that applies to you as a provider in the instructions that we've published on our website. We'll now move on to the B conditions that relate to quality and standards. This slide is for existing providers. Existing providers will not need to submit any evidence to enable us to assess these conditions. We will use the outcomes from the current quality assessment systems, and we will construct indicators from existing data which you've already submitted. So what information will we look at for existing providers that have previously been funded by HEFKE? For conditions B1, 2, 4 and 5, 
we will look at the outcomes from the annual provider review, or APR, that was previously run by Hefke. If you went through a quality review visit as part of this process, we will also look at the outcome of that visit. To satisfy these conditions, we would normally expect you to have an APR outcome of meet expectations or meet expectations with an action plan. If you had a quality review visit, we would normally expect the judgments from this to provide confidence. Where providers were required to implement an action plan following either of these processes, we will consider progress against this and expect that progress will be satisfactory. We would also expect you to have no adverse findings through the unsatisfactory quality scheme. We'll look at the evidence we'll use for condition B3 a little later in the presentation. For existing providers that had course designation and any embedded colleges with a tier four license, for conditions B1, 2, 4 and 5, we will look at your higher education review outcomes from the Quality Assurance Agency and the outcomes of the Quality Assurance Agency's annual monitoring processes. To meet this condition, we would normally expect you to have achieved an outcome of meets expectations in relation to the academic standards and quality of student learning opportunities judgments in those reviews. As for Hefke funded providers, where the outcomes are below this standard, we will consider progress that has been made against any action plans that you're required to implement. We will also give consideration to any adverse judgments from concerns investigations and the resulting action plan. So for condition B3, all existing providers will be assessed against the same indicators related to student continuation and completion, student outcomes, including where outcomes are different for different groups of students, graduate employment and progression. The indicators we will use will be constructed from existing data sets, so no new data submissions are required. We are seeking evidence that demonstrates you've reached a minimum baseline, so we will consider absolute performance over time rather than performance against a benchmark. We will though consider provider context in our judgment where appropriate. For example, if you have a particular mix of provision that may explain significant differences in your performance. Where you have limited or unreliable data, we will monitor your performance as reliable data becomes available. This slide relates to how new providers meet the quality and standards condition. For new providers, as we do not currently hold any information about you, we will require you to go through a quality and standards review. This review will be conducted by the Quality Assurance Agency as they have been designated by the Secretary of State as the designated quality body under the Higher Education and Research Act. The QIA will consult on the methodology over the coming months and we expect the reviews to be available from August 2018. Finally, as we do not hold data on student outcomes for new providers, we will not look at condition B3 during the registration process, but we will look at this data as and when it becomes available. Finally, for this section, before we get to an opportunity for some questions, we'll look at the C conditions. Condition C1 relates to consumer protection law. All providers, whether they're existing or new, are required to submit evidence for this condition. So what do you need to provide? We ask you to submit a self-assessment of how you've given due regard to the relevant guidance about how to comply with consumer protection law. The relevant guidance has been issued by the Competitions and Market Authority, and details of this can be found in our advice on applying, which is on our website. Your self-assessment will need to demonstrate the following. Your overall approach to ensuring compliance with consumer protection law, your approach to providing information to applicants and students through each of the research and application stage, offer stage, and the enrollment stage, your contract terms and conditions, by which we mean the contracts you use to govern your relationships with students, and how you have ensured that these are fair and have transparent terms and conditions, and your complaint handling processes and practices. So what do we mean by our self-assessment? We have provided a template which maps across to the areas of the CMA guidance. It's important that when you complete the self-assessment, you use evidence statements rather than assertions. In our assessment of this condition, we will be looking to understand how you know you comply with guidance. So for example, how do you know your information to applicants is accurate and clear? And how do you know that your terms and conditions are fair and transparent? We have not set a word limit for these self-assessments, but do not expect them to be lengthy documents. 
If you wish, you do not need to use our template, but you must cover the information that's required of you. We expect that much of the evidence that you would want to refer to will be contained in other documents. You should include references to these and any hyperlinks where they're publicly available, but there is no need to submit each of the separate documents. If we require further evidence as part of our assessment, we will ask you for it. Finally, these self-assessments do not need to be public documents, and we as the OFS will not publish them. The final condition we'll look at before we take a break for questions is C3, the Student Protection Plan. This is a requirement to have a student protection plan that has been approved by the Office for Students and once approved that is published on your website. So what evidence do you need to provide during the application process? All providers must submit a plan that addresses the following issues in the specific context of your provider. Firstly, you must include an assessment of the range of risks to the continu continuation of study for your students, including how these risks may differ based on your students' different needs, characteristics and circumstances, and the likelihood that these risks will crystallise. Then you must detail the measures you have put in place to mitigate those risks that you consider to be reasonably likely to crystallise. You also need to include information about the policies you have in place to refund tuition fees and other relevant costs to your students and to provide compensation where necessary in the event that you are no longer able to preserve continuation of study. Finally, your plan must include information about how you will communicate with your students about your student protection plan. When we talk about risks that might be covered in your student protection plan, we do not want to be restrictive as many of you operate in different markets and have different models of operation. However, we would suggest that the risks listed on this slide might be relevant to most providers. We've highlighted subject and course closure here, as it is likely that most providers will close courses, subjects or departments as part of their normal curriculum reviews. Of course, there'll be strategic reasons for those curriculum reviews, and it is through your plan that we would like to see how you will manage these to ensure positive student experiences and outcomes. If you think that there are risks that are unlikely to occur for your organisation, then you should be clear that these are not covered in your plan and why you consider them to be unlikely. For example, your financial performance and business continuity plans may mean that it's unlikely that your institution as a whole will cease operations entirely, in which case we would not expect to see mitigations for this risk in your plan. Through your self-assessment, you should be explicit about which areas are considered to be high risk, and it is in these areas we would expect to see the most detail in terms of planned mitigation. We'll pause again at this point to review any questions that have come in related to the conditions of registration we've covered so far, which are access and participation, quality and standards, and student protection. Jess and Anna will take us through the questions and Becky and I will do our best to answer them. Hi, Jack. So we've had uh, a number of questions about deadlines, but I think we're going to be covering that later in the presentation. Yes, we will. Okay. Um, we have a question here about the access and participation plan. Is that something we can talk about now? We'll be able to provide um, some advice, but okay. um, I'd recommend that people go and look at the access and participation plan section of our website. Okay. This one's just quite a general one. It's about um, if a provider submits a draft access and participation plan, will they be able to receive interim advice from OFS before a final submission is made? Um, access and participation plans need to be submitted as part of uh, your general application. The process for access and participation plans is slightly different to the rest of the process in that the director, Chris Millwood, will engage in interaction and challenge during the um, development of your access and participation plan. But we would strongly encourage providers to try and get to as close a final draft as possible. Um, and when we come to the um, question of deadlines, you'll see that there is some flexibility in when you can choose to apply. So. Um, my advice would be to try and make that um, submission as close to final as possible. But if you do want to talk to someone, then um, please get in touch with us and we can put you in contact with someone in the Access Participation team. Thanks, Jack. So we had another question um, saying, as an approved provider, will there be a VAT exemption for AP? Um, so questions about VAT exemption are the responsibility of HMRC. We can't give advice on that at the moment, um, but 
we expect that given the change in the regulatory environment, HMRC will issue some new guidance at some point in the future. And if that becomes available during the registration process, we will, of course, flag it on our website. We have another question here. How will the OFS review colleges that were formed through a merger during the current academic year? Is there any advice you can give now about that? There is some advice in our guidance about what to do if colleges are merging. Um, there are a couple of options. Either depending on when you merge, you can apply as two separate institutions um, and we will assess you individually. The lead provider could apply and then we would consider um, once you have merged the new merged entity um, or you wait until you have merged um, and then we can assess your application in one go. Um, but that is outlined in the guidance for current providers. And we really recognise that the merger process is particularly for further education colleges at the moment. Um, the timings of them can be quite difficult to predict. So if you're unsure about how to apply, please do pick up the phone and have a conversation with us and we'll talk you through it. Thanks, Jack. Uh, we had a question, I think it relates to the B conditions um, related to the um, HER review from the QAA um, and asking whether uh, the outcome, the judgment through the enhancement section would affect um, OFS registration. So the reason that we're using the QAA reviews is because that's the available quality assessment information we have. If you look at the conditions that we have around um, quality and standards, the Office for Students is seeking to establish a baseline um, rather than drive enhancement through its individual provider regulation. So we, we don't particularly look at the um, enhancement aspects of a uh, review. However, what I would say is that we will look at the whole review and should anything come out of that that um, causes any concern, then that may get picked up in another area of our um, assessment. So for example, we may find um, information on information for students that would be relevant to our assessment of your compliance with consumer uh, protection law. And that holds true for the APR process for hefty funded providers as well. Um, but in terms of the quality and standards conditions, we'll be focusing on the first two judgments in the HER app. Great, thanks. We've had a, a related question that may just have been a, a misunderstanding when we referred to B3. I think we were talking about condition B3 of um, the OFS registration conditions. So I think there just may have been a confusion that someone thought this was section B3 of the HER review. Yes, sorry. Um, so where we refer to conditions, they're the ones contained in the regulatory framework. Um, so when we deal with quality and standards for existing providers, we're going to largely do it in two sections. So conditions B1, 2, 4, and 5 will deal with through reference to the previous quality assessment regimes, and B3 will deal with through reference to the student outcomes indicators that we'll construct. Right. Um, we have a question about condition C1, um, and how much does the OFS want to see about non-academic contracts? And are we going to use the CMA checklist when we go through submissions? Um, so our focus on the condition is on students. Um, so we would be concerned in uh, your assessment to see how you comply with consumer protection with relation to your students. So all students, postgraduate, undergraduate, um, but only focusing on your students. If you want to mention any other aspects of your compliance that demonstrate uh, the completeness of your approach, then, then please do so. But we're focused on students. Um, and the second question was about whether we use the CMA checklist. Yes, that's right. So just to be explicit, the role of the Office for Students isn't to ensure compliance with consumer legislation. That remains the role of the CMA, and they will be focused on that. So we won't be doing an assessment which focuses on checking that you have complied with particular aspects of consumer legislation. Our assessment is trying to understand that you are clear and that you have appropriate measures in place. So if you've used the CMA checklist to ensure compliance, 
that would be a really excellent thing to mention in the evidence that you submit to us, but we won't be running through it as a separate exercise. However, should at a point in your registration, we identify that you haven't done something that you should have done under consumer protection um, legislation, then we would come back to your initial self-assessment to understand the assurances that you gave us. Thanks. Jack, we have um, a, a question then about the student protection plan, um, which asks if the STP should be written with the student as the audience or for the OSS. So that's a really helpful question. Um, and partly the answer is down to you as a provider. So the, the regulatory framework requires that your student protection plan is published. Um, however, we strongly recognize that the things that you need to include in the student protection plan may lead to a document that is not entirely student friendly. Um, so we've had conversations with a number of providers that are planning on producing two versions. So a student version that links to the formal approved version um, and the version that you seek formal approval for. If you're planning on doing that, please do let us know. And our expectation would be that the information that is in a student facing version would exactly replicate the information on the key issues that's contained in your um, approved plan. But if you have any questions about that, then please do raise them with us um, our email address is registration at officeforstudents.org.uk or you can give us a call on 0117 931 7488 and we'd be happy to talk to you about that at any point during the application process. Thanks, Jack. I think we may have run into some technical difficulties with the questions that are coming in because we can't view them properly at the moment. So perhaps if we continue with the presentation and, and see if we can come back to questions a bit later. Okay, great. If you are sending questions in, we will make sure we capture them. We're going to put a frequently asked questions document up on our website, um, which will pull in the questions that we had from our conferences earlier in March and also from today. And if you do have a really specific question about you as a provider that you would like answered, then please send it into the registrations at officeforstudents.org.uk and that will get picked up by a member of the registrations team and you'll get a direct response from that. The next condition we're going to look at is condition D, and this is all about financial viability and sustainability of your organization. First, we'll deal with the approach for existing providers. Existing providers will not generally need to submit new evidence. The only time we will need any new evidence is where you have new audited financial statements since your last submission to HEFKE. I've got some further detail about this on a later slide. So this is the evidence that we're going to use for existing providers. So for higher education institutions that were previously funded by HEFKE, you do not need to submit any new information as we'll rely on the most recent submissions that you made to HEFKE. These are listed on the slide. For further education colleges and sixth form colleges, we'll use the information provided to us by the Education Skills and Funding Agency. And finally, for existing alternative providers with course designation, we may require additional evidence depending on when your financial year ends. So if it's nine months since your last financial year end at the point that you submit your application for registration to the OFS, we will need you to submit new audited accounts and forecasts. We will have written to you individually if we think this is the case. So for new providers, for this condition, new providers will need to submit a full set of information. But what this looks like depends on how long you've been trading and running higher education. The next slide takes you through what you need to do. The information that new providers will need to submit will depend on the length of time that they have been trading. The first thing to say is that you must submit audited financial statements to us regardless of whether this is a legal requirement for your business or whether you have an exemption from filing such accounts at Companies House or with the Charity Commission due to your size or legal form. We require financial statements to be audited by an independent external auditor before submission so that we can have confidence in the information that you send to us. If you haven't submitted any um, financial statements or had them audited before, then please set out, um, then we have set out in our advice for applying details of what must be included in your financial statement. 
please do take a look at this and we would recommend sharing it with the company who are going to audit your accounts so they're clear about exactly what it is we need within your financial statements. If you submit unaudited financial statements to us, then we'll be unable to consider your application for registration. If you haven't been trading for three years, you'll need to submit as many audited as many years worth of audited financial statements as are available. However, if you're entirely new and your accounts are not yet available, we will need you to provide a business plan and details of your financial backing. The full details of the requirements in this area are in our advice for applying, but we will be happy to discuss with any new provider what is required, so please do not hesitate to pick up the phone. The next set of conditions is around good governance. So condition E1 looks at your governing documents. We have a wide view of what should be counted as your governing documents, and we consider these to be any document that describe your objectives and values, powers, who has a role in your decision making, how you take decisions about how to exercise your functions, and how you monitor the exercise of your functions. This will vary for different providers and those with different corporate forms, and we have set out some examples on the next slide. I should say that this condition applies to all providers existing and current. I'm sorry, existing and new. So this slide includes some examples of governing documents. They include royal charters, statutes and ordinances, articles of association, instruments of government, governance, or trust deeds. However, they might also include schemes of delegation, terms of references for your committees, policies on matters such as management of conflicts of interest, and member or shareholder agreements. This wide view of governing documents we hope means that you may not be required to make significant changes to your royal charters or any of your other uh, formal documents that govern you as an institution. However, if you have some concerns about this, then please do get in touch. So what are the public interest governance principles that need to be reflected in your governing documents? This slide sets them out for you, but I would encourage you to have a look at the regulatory framework to understand these in more detail. For those of you who have followed the development of the regulatory framework, um, you'll notice that since consultation, student engagement has been added as a public interest governance principle. And this is likely to be new for all providers, whether you were previously hefty funded or not. These are the principles that apply to all providers. If you're applying to register in the approved fee cap category, this means you will have access to public grant funding. As such, there are two additional requirements on this slide that will help provide assurance to Parliament for the public funding that you receive. You will need to demonstrate that you will be able to meet these requirements once funding begins. And the funding will begin on the 1st of August 2019. So for example, if you do not currently have an audit committee, you will need to demonstrate that one will be in place by the 1st of August 2019. We will need to be satisfied that your plans to do this look reasonable. So simply stating a commitment to establish one is probably not enough. We need to see the detail of how you're going to achieve this, the timescales for doing so, and any other plans that you have. Finally, this slide talks about um, the need to demonstrate during your application the effectiveness and appropriateness of your management and governance arrangements. This is a condition that all providers will need to meet and the other condition where we require a self-assessment. Your self-assessment for this must include a description of your management and governance arrangements for your higher education provision, an assessment of your management and governance arrangements that demonstrate how you believe the arrangements for your higher education provision are adequate and effective. If you follow an independent governance code, you might use this as key evidence here. And finally, you need to include an assessment of how your governing documents uphold the public interest governance principles relevant to your application. It is for you to describe to us what your governance arrangements are and how they are appropriate and effective. So for example, small providers might not have something called a governing body and the senior management team might undertake all of the functions that in a larger provider would be delegated to committees. This is fine and we would simply expect you to describe this and how you've determined that this is appropriate for your organisation. So what does your self-assessment need to look like? Again, we've provided templates for different types of providers as a guide. 
These are available on our website. If these don't work for you, then please do use something different. For example, heavily funded higher education institutions might want to point to the information in their published accounts if this meets the requirements and then simply complete the self-assessment against the principles of good governance. Just a reminder again that with self-assessments, you do not need to include specific documents, but please do send us links and the correct titles for them so we can ask for them if they're required. And we won't be making these self-assessments public. So we've reached the end of this section, so we'll pause again for any remaining questions on the initial conditions of registration. Anna, Jess, have we had anything else in? Um, this one's more really about the categories of registration. So what's the advantage of going for the approved category? Why not just go, go for approved fee cap and get those additional benefits that come with that category? Um, so going back to those categories of registration, the one thing that I'd say at the top is it's not for us as the OFS to advise you on what the correct category to apply for is. But one of the most significant differences is the cap on fees and the access to public funding. So if you're an, a provider that currently charges fees above the basic amount, then you may want to consider whether the approved category is right for you. Because if you apply for approved fee cap, you'll never be able to charge more than 9,000, uh, the higher amounts so are 9,000 or 9,250 for any of your eligible undergraduate students. So there are providers out there who charge significantly above that amount and it may not be economical for them to apply in that category. The other reason for the difference between the two categories is that if you did not apply for the approved fee cap category, you wouldn't have to meet the two additional principles of um, good governance. So it may be that providers feel that they're not in a position to do that by the 1st of August 2019 and therefore may wish to apply for approved fee cap or uh, a proof gap at a later date or may always choose to stay as an approved provider. Great, thank you. Can I ask another sort of follow-on question about the approved fee cap category? So in that category, are all courses capped or is it only designated courses that will be capped? Um, so I'm assuming this is a question possibly from a previous alternative provider who had courses designated. Um, so all of your eligible courses will be capped. Um, there, in the in the way that alternative providers have specific designation, that doesn't really exist in the new regulatory framework. Um, so all of your eligible courses would be capped. But if you've got some specific questions about that, um, then please do get in contact with us, and we can talk you through it. So we've had a couple of questions come in around the student protection plan. So obviously um, the providers said they, they expect to update their plan sort of on an annual basis as risks change. They just wondered um, as the, you know, the, the plan will be published to students, is it only risks that are likely to affect those particular students at the time rather than something like that might happen say five or ten years down the line? Sort of how forward looking does the plan need to be? Um, our expectations around student protection plans are that they are useful documents for those students applying and currently studying with you as an, an institution. So that naturally puts something of a kind of time horizon on those courses. So for example, if you were simply providing full-time undergraduate provision on a traditional three-year basis, it may be that it's sensible for you as an institution to focus your student protection plan on that medium term time horizon of around three years. However, there are providers out there who run courses for a much longer period of time. Um, and we would want to know that a student signing up for a course with you at the start of their course would have a reasonable sense of those risks going into the future for the length of their course. Great, thank you. And just another student protection plan question. Um, how much information is needed regarding the risks and their mitigation, particularly in relation to institutional partners and those based overseas, for example? So we haven't specified a length for um, student protection plans and the level of detail. What I would say is that the greater the risk, the more detail we would expect to see in there. Um, and we would all, I would also remind people at this point that the 
um, student protection plan is a published document. So you'll need to bear that in mind when you're presenting information to students. If you have some very specific questions about the level of detail that you want to put in your plan, please get in touch with us. And when you submit your student protection plan, or when you submit your application, Becky will talk in a minute about the fact that you'll get a named contact. So if there is insufficient evidence or insufficient information about a risk in your student protection plan, we will come back to you and ask you for more. Um, so there will be an opportunity for you to iterate your student protection plan during the application process. All right, thank you. Just got one here about the changing categories. So if a provider originally wants to charge fees at the basic level and they submit an access and participation statement to us, if at a later date they want to increase fees and be able to charge a higher amount, are they able to then sort of apply with the access and participation plan? Are there any time scales around that? They would need to um, co contact the OFS and let us know and they would need to have an approved access and participation plan approved by the Director for Fair Access and Participation. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. Okay. Um, so what might be useful to do is perhaps we're going to continue with the next part of the presentation. We'll try and sort through those um, and put them into some kind of order and pick them up perhaps right at, at the end. Yeah. Great. Um, so briefly, before I pass back to Becky, I just wanted to talk you through how to submit, uh, who'll talk you through how to submit your application and when we'll assess it. I just wanted to run through a few quick points on degree awarding powers or DAPs. The changes to degree awarding powers were one of the major changes brought in by the Higher Education and Research Act. And the new approach to degree awarding powers or, or new DAPs will now be available to all providers without current degree awarding powers, regardless of their track record. So there was a suggestion in the original um, regulatory framework that new DAPs would only be available to new providers, but that has since changed. The full guidance on the requirements and the process for applying will be published in summer 2018. However, you must be registered in order for us to see who is eligible for applying for degree, new degree awarding powers. So we're, probably, we're going to start considering applications from September, but there'll be a space on your application form, and you may well have seen it if you've downloaded your form already, for you to indicate that you're interested in degree awarding powers and when you think you may be interested in applying. As I said, we've published a document um, on the transition arrangements for degree awarding powers and university title. This is up on the website at the moment, and I would encourage you to go there have a look. It's a relatively short document as it sets out the next few milestones in the process for developing um, our approach to degree awarding powers in university title. It includes information about the timing of the transfer of powers from the Department of Education and the Privy Council to the Office for Students. And if you've got any questions specifically relating to DAPS or university title, we've set up a couple of dedicated email addresses that are up on the screen now. Um, if you email this, you'll get through to the t our team who's working on degree awarding powers, and they'll be able to pick up any of your specific questions there. So for now, I'll hand back to Becky. So the final part of our webinar, we'll look at three things. We'll look at the application process, how we will assess your application, and then there'll be some time for questions at the end. So firstly, how do you apply? The online application portal opened on Tuesday and you should have received instructions from us via email just before the week Easter weekend about this. You should have also received an access key to allow you access to the portal. The access keys were sent to all registration contacts and by exception to heads of providers where we did not currently hold a nominated registra registration contact. We'll just note there is one access key per provider and we can only provide it to these contacts so you are free to share the key within your institution as necessary. To access the portal, you will need to register yourself as a user. At the point in time that you do this, you will also need to enter the access key that you have been provided with. Once you have accessed the portal, it is here that you can download a copy of your application form. We would just like to flag that some details have been pre-populated for you where we hold the information and you should therefore check that these details are correct and make any amendments where necessary. 
The rest of the form will be blank for you to complete. From the portal, you can also download your APP resource plan if required, as well as some of the other templates. Once you've completed your application form, as well as all the other documents, you can upload these to the portal. What we would like to highlight is that you do not need to complete the, app the whole process in one go. However, as we will not accept incomplete ac applications, you should only click Submit once you are satisfied that everything is complete and all the necessary documents have been uploaded. So what happens after you submit? As Jack has already mentioned, once you've submitted your application, you'll be provided with a named contact in the EarthSurf registration team. This person will be responsible for communicating with you throughout the assessment process. If you're applying in the approved fee cap category and are intending to charge fees above the basic amount, you will also be submitting an access and participation plan. We do have a separate dedicated team responsible for assessing these and undertaking the discussion and challenge Jack mentioned earlier. So if the, in these instances, you will also receive a name contact in this team. The named registration team contact will complete, complete some basic checks to make sure we have all the information we need to assess your application. And we'll let you know if we think there is anything missing. We'll now move on to how we will assess your application. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have some time for questions later. I know some of you were asking about this earlier, um, and this slide sets up some key timescales for registration. Firstly, just to say, um, there are no deadlines for submitting applications to register with us. However, what we have done is publish a number of key advisory dates by which particular providers may wish to submit their application. These are outlined on the slides. So for providers who have an early student recruitment cycle, which normally applies if you offer medical, dentistry, veterinary or conservatoire provision, then we have advised that you should apply for registration by Monday the 30th of April. When we sent out our previous communications to you, we will have let you know if we think this applies to you. However, please contact us if, we think you've, if you think we've missed anything or if you have any questions regarding this. As outlined on the slide, if you apply by this date, you will receive a registration decision and if successful, be listed on the OFS register by mid-July 2018. For providers with a standard student recruitment cycle, we've advised that you should probably apply by Wednesday the 23rd of May. In these cases, if you apply by this date, you will receive a registration decision and if successful, be listed on the register by mid-September 2017. The last date on the slide is Friday the 31st of August. We've highlighted this date for providers wishing to receive public grant funding for the first time in 1920. And this is just to ensure that we have sufficient time to calculate the funding calculations for that year. Like I said, though, there are no deadlines and if you have any questions on this, please do not hesitate to contact us. This slide outlines how we will assess your application. So as mentioned earlier, once we have received your application, you will be allocated an assessor who will be your contact throughout the assessment process. If there are any questions during this time, we will approach you for clarification. Moving on, we will undertake a detailed ass assessment of all the initial conditions of registration at the same time, apart from your student protection plan, which we will come to shortly. As we've already mentioned, there is a separate approval process for your access and participation plan, um, but you will receive one registration outcome. We will assess the evidence that Jack has described earlier um, that you have submitted, as well as for current providers, any evidence previously collected by HEFKE, DFE and ESFA. As I've just said, the student protection plan will be assessed after we have considered all the other initial conditions of registration. Doing it this way will enable us to assess your student protection plan in light of our assessment of the risk of you breaching a condition of registration in the future. We will compare our own assessment of risk against your assessment and if necessary, we will enter into a dialogue with you whether there are any areas of difference or as Jack mentioned earlier, where we may want you student protection plan to be refined.
the NFS is required by law to act in proportion to its view of a risk that a provider will breach a condition of the regulatory framework. Therefore, at registration, we will make a risk assessment against each condition. This will be made up of a judgment of likelihood that a condition will be breached and the severity of impact if a condition was to be breached. We will create a risk profile of breach for each condition. However, it's important to note we will not form an aggregated risk judgment for each provider. Our risk assessment will be used to determine any regulatory action we may want to take to mitigate the risk. This may include, for example, enhanced monitoring or the application of specific conditions of registration. We'll just highlight that our risk assessment will not be made public, but we will inform you of our assessment if we are intending to take any such mitigating actions. We will, however, publish any specific ongoing conditions of registration on the OFS register unless we consider it inappropriate to do so. So moving on, what happens next? If your outcome is successful, then we will write to you to confirm the date of your registration and the date on which we will publish your details on the OFS register, that you satisfy the initial conditions of registration, the general ongoing conditions of registration that will apply to you, whether we will impose any specific conditions of registration, and whether we will put in any enhanced monitoring or other regulatory action. If your application is unsuccessful and we intend to refuse your application for registration, then we will notify your governing body of our intention to do so. This letter will set out the reasons for our intention to refuse your application for registration, the method for you to make representations of about our intention, to confirm that you have 28 days from the date of notification to, refute, to make such representations, and to confirm that we will consider any representations you wish to make before making our final decision. So what happens once you're registered? If you are sec successfully registered, you will need to continue to satisfy our regulatory requirements. When we write to you with our decision, we will explain what you need to do to stay registered as we mentioned earlier, there will be a period of transition between the point of your registration up until the 31st of July 2019. Information regarding how providers will be regulated during this period was published on the 29th of March through a series of regulatory notices. I will just flag at this point that there are different regulatory notices depending on your current status, so please um, have a look through on our website. There is no fee payable for the initial registration process. However, you will be required to pay an annual registration fee from the 1st of August 2019, and separate guidance on fees will be published following this. The RFS regulatory framework will be fully implemented from the 1st of August 2019, as we discussed earlier. This slide looks at further information and support that will be available during the registration process. As mentioned earlier, we do now have our own help and advice page, which can be found under the How to Register section of the website. As outlined on the screen, we'll be holding some more one-to-one -one surgeries in London and hopefully some other locations that will be confirmed shortly. Please get in touch if you would be interested in one of these. We will also be publishing frequently asked questions on our website, which, we're, which, we're, which we will be updated periodically. As Jack's already mentioned, we've got a dedicated team for registration. We have a phone line and email address as shown on the screen. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. And as mentioned, from the point at which you submit your application, you will be given a named RFS contact for the process. As promised, I think there's some time now for questions, so we'll just check with Anna and Jess to see if we've had any questions coming in. Thanks, Becky. We've had um, just a few questions about the portal, the application portal. Um, so the first one of those was, what do new providers need to do to receive access to the application portal? If you are a new provider and haven't had any communication for, from us, um, please contact us via the registration inbox um, and we can set up access for you. Great, thanks, Becky. And another, uh, I think, a quick one as well. Uh, can more than one member of staff use the same access key? Uh, yes, they can, um, but what we would remind you is that when you come to finally submit your documents, the application form asks you that 
you're submitting them on behalf of your governing body and that you have approval to do so. So you may want to internally decide on who's going to hit the final submit button and um, make sure that you've appropriately briefed um, senior people in your organisation. Great, thanks, Jack. And just one more about, about the portal. Um, we've had someone asking if they have um, a user account from the old Hefke Extranet, will that continue to function? Yes, absolutely will. You'll need to pop in the access key for the OFS registration, um, and you'll see some slightly different fonts and formatting in there. Um, hopefully, we've streamlined things a bit, but um, you, st you still will be able to log in and you'll have the opportunity to do that. And if you didn't have previous access to the Hefke Extranet, then you'll be able to create an account the first time you go in. Okay. Um, oh, apologies. I've just had a bit of a technical error, so I just need to swap to another computer and see if I can get the question back up. We've also had a couple of questions in about fees. Do you have any more information about when fees might be published? Uh, fees for OFS registration? Yes. So um, the fees for OFS registration are set by um, the Secretary of State, so it's the responsibility of the Department for Education, um, and they also need to be confirmed by Parliament. Um, so the latest information we have is the consultation outcome that was published on the 28th of February, which can be found on the Department for Education's website. Um, that set, sets out the government's proposed approach, but that needs to be taken before Parliament, and we're expecting that to happen in the spring of 2019. So it'll be at that point that we'll have final confirmation. But if you do go to um, have a look at that consultation document, then you can see um, the bandings and the estimated fee. Thanks, Jack. I think I'm back up and running. So um, I have a couple of questions um, to, to go back to a bit earlier in the presentation when we were talking about the different categories of registration, so the approved and the approved fee cap. Um, if you could just clarify uh, what are the key differences between those two categories. Okay, so um, I would encourage anyone who's thinking about which category to apply in to have a good read of both the regulatory framework, um, which has a section on the categories, and also the advice for applying, which talks about this. Um, but the, the core differences are around um, your access to student support. So um, you'll only be able to access student support, so that's tuition fee loans, um, up to the higher amount if you're an approved VCAP provider. Um, if you choose to do this, you'll need to have an access and participation plan approved by the Director of Fair Access. So that's one significant difference. Um, if you're an approved provider, your fees will be uncapped. So you'll be able to charge whatever you like to your students, um, but you'll only be able to access tuition fee loans up to the basic amount. And as an approved provider, you will not be able to access public funding that comes through the Office for Students or through UK Research and Innovation. Um, the funding there that's distributed by Research England. So those are um, the core differences. But the choice of which category to apply in is down to you as an individual provider and organisation. Those are business decisions um, about what works for your organisation. Um, but if you would like to talk through your understanding of the categories or what that might mean for your institution, then please do get in touch with us and we'll be happy to talk to you about that. Great. Thanks, Jack. And there's a, a related question about the, the categories there, and if there are any implications if, if one were to apply in just the approved category, um, are there any implications about fees that can be charged to international students? Uh, no, the arrangements for capping of fees or not capping of fees apply to eligible students, and that's um, UK and EU students at the moment. Um, obviously, that may change um, following Brexit, but at the moment, that's uh, home and EU students. And again, there's a lot more detail about this in both the regulatory framework and the advice for how to apply. Great. Thanks, Jack. Just another one related to the categories of registration. If a provider is not successful in applying for the approved fee cap category, are they automatically offered an approved registration category instead, or is there anything further that they have to do? If we are um, intended to refuse um, your um, 
application in the approved VCAP category, we will contact you and um, speak to you about whether you meet the conditions for um, approved instead. Great. And uh, another related question on, on the different categories. Um, so this one says, if applying for the approved VCAP, but at the lower level, um, would 6165 be the maximum amount we can charge students? Yes. Great, a simple one. <laughs> if you just bear with us a moment while we filter through. We've had quite a lot of questions coming mm. in. Good, and as I said um, earlier in the webinar, it's really helpful that we've got all of these questions. We will um, download them all and put them into our frequently asked questions bank. Um, and we'll also make sure that whenever we hold events that we try and address these going forward. But if it's a, a particular question that you want answered as an institution, then please just pick up the phone and have a conversation with us. We're more than happy to talk you through that. And we have got the one-to-one -one surgeries as well, um, and the details are on our website for those if you wanted a kind of tailored um, support session with us. Great, thank you. So we have a question here about the TEF, and whilst we understand it's not a initial condition of registration, will it affect the fees that a provider can charge under the approved fee cap category? Um, the answer to that is partly um, it depends on government policy. So at the moment, the government's policy is to freeze um, tuition fees um, for 2018-19. Um, we haven't had any confirmation beyond that. Um, but as soon as government policy is announced in that area, we will um, inform all registered providers. Of course, the original intent of the TEF was to allow for fee increases, but there has been um, a shift in government policy on that. So uh, the final decision on that rests in the hands of the government rather than the OFS. Thanks, Jack. Um, I think this one is also related to the, the categories of, of registration. Um, so under the approved fee cap category, the provider can access public funding. And the question that we've been asked is, is does access to public funding under OSS also cover the ESFA? Um, no. So when we talk about um, public funding, we mean the Office for Students um, public funding, which um, is broadly equivalent to the Hefke teaching funding, although there may be changes to the approach in the future. So please don't rely on the um, previous Hefke approach for understanding what that might look like, and also the funding that comes through Research England. Thank you. Now this one's a bit more of a um, future looking one, so I'm not sure how much you'll be able to say on this, but what will the role of the Quality Assurance Agency be going forward? For example, will they do separate quality assessments so the um, QA have been designated as the designated quality body um, working with the OFS. So one of their primary roles in the first instance is that they will be conducting the quality review visits for new providers. Um, and as Jack mentioned, that review method will be available later on in the summer. Great. Thanks, Betty. Um, and related to that, I think this question that's come in is um, against the can be conditions about quality. Um, so it's related to any provider that might have an action plan in progress, I, I am assuming from uh, previous uh, Hefke APR processes or possibly through the QAA. And the question is, um, how would they be expected to provide evidence of progress against an action plan? So we'll take um, the evidence from the information that we currently hold. So for providers that have an meets uh, expectations with an action plan from the Hefke APR process, then Hefke um, worked with providers on the action plan and we have uh, the information on progress there and we will be taking from the QAA annual monitoring of action plans for the higher education review for APs as to whether progress is satisfactory. What I would say here is um, I hope that people clocked during those slides that when we set out um, our expectations, that is what we would normally expect. Um, but the, they're not hard and fast rules. So for example, if you're an alternative provider who has recently had a higher education review AP and you have your final judgment, 
but haven't had the opportunity to demonstrate that you're satisfactorily meeting your action plan, then we will want to have a conversation with you about the content of that, and that will determine whether we uh, whether we consider you to have met those conditions or not. And the same will hold true for any providers who go through uh, who are in a similar position for their HEFG APR process. Um, so if you are uncertain or unsure about what your outcome means for you, then again, there's a conversation that we can have with you, or please come along to one of our one-to-one -one surgeries and we can talk to you about that in person. A very similar question, so I think you've probably just, just answered that um, there, but I'll, I'll just read it out anyway. So if we have an action plan in place, and that action plan will influence uh, our registration application, when will contacts be allocated to oversee or monitor the action plan pre-application? Um, so the transition documents that Becky mentioned are up online now, and that talks about um, the approaches that we'll take to quality assessment during um, from this point onwards, so from the establishment of the Office for Students. Um, so some of the details will be in there. So if you have an action plan, I'd uh, recommend picking up the relevant one of those documents and having a look. Um, but in terms of the conversation with us, uh, how that applies to registration, you'll get a named contact from the point that you apply, and that person will read through um, the outcomes from your uh, reviews and any action plans, and will discuss with you whether there's uh, any issues arising from those. Right. Thank you, Jack. Just bear with us a moment while we sort through. Um, so. We have a provider here. So, if a new if a new provider has recently had a QAA review, will it require another review for the purposes of registration? Um, I think we would want to have a conversation with them about which review they had and for what purposes. Um, so, I'm not sure I'd want to be definitive about that because the uh, the answer will probably depend on the circumstances of the provider. So. Um, whoever it was that asked that question, or if it applies to you and you didn't ask that question, then please do drop us a line or give us a call. Um, so this question is about um, the condition related to the CMA, um, related to CMA guidance. Do you need to attach any evidence to your CMA self-assessment and or provide hyperlinks? If there are documents that you wish to direct us towards, please feel free to um, give us the hyperlinks of where they are on your website, and then we can take a look at them. And if we need to request any further information from you, then we can. And if they're not publicly available, then just tell us what they are. So if there's a document you rely on in your self-assessment, Tell us what it is, tell us where it was approved by, um, but you don't need to send it in as a separate document. If we if we have concerns or if um, we want to get some further information, we'll come back to you and ask. Um, so please don't feel like you need to submit fast um, tracks of supporting information. Great, thanks. So we just have another question here about these suggested application deadlines that you talked about earlier. So if we have a, a provider who is currently funded by HEFGI, do they need to get their application in by the suggested May date in order to get funding for 1819? Or how does the when when does the sort of the funding kick in for after you've applied for the OFS? So any provider that's um, going to be funded by Hefke for 1819 will have been informed of that already. Um, the information is up on the OFS website, was up on the Hefke website, which is currently um, archived, so you can go and have a look at it. And your application for registration won't affect your funding for 1819. Um, so there's no requirements in those terms. The date that was on the slide was about the receipt of funding for 2019-20. Yes, that's the August date. And the, the May deadline is just so it's more from a student perspective, so that when prospective students are looking to apply, um, with a standard recruitment cycle, we would know the students are starting to look in kind of September, October, ahead of the UCAS January deadline. Um, and that's just so that students know, um, that's just to help students from a, a kind of choice and information perspective. Um, and on that note, there is some information in the guidance about what you can put on your website um, for students ahead of that date. That's great. Thank you. 
Jumping around a little bit, I hope that's okay for you. Um, we have a couple of questions about um, governance. So uh, quite a broad question, which is, do you take a view on the makeup of the governing board in any way? Um, so that will in part be um, considered in the principles of good governance. So what you'll need to have a look at is where in the regulatory framework it um, talks about what those principles are. Um, there are some aspects of that that relate to um, equality and diversity and how you reflect that. Um, and we would also expect um, providers to be reflecting on that when they're thinking about how they know that it's an effective um, governing body. So that's certainly something we would want providers to be picking up there. You may also want to be talking about it in your access and participation statement, but just a reminder that that document won't be formally approved or assessed. So um, that's your choice as a provider. Great, thanks, Jack. And then um, a more specific question um, uh, from a very small provider um, with a governing body of only two people, two person management team. Um, the question is, could you confirm that that would be okay as long as we meet governance principles, or do we have to set up a separate governing body? So just, just to clarify, a, a small privately owned provider um, with a gov the governing body is the, is the two-person management mm -hmm. team currently. Is that okay, or do we need to set up a separate governing body? Um, the short answer is that depends on the nature of the organisation. Um, but the Office for Students, we haven't set out what the required governance arrangements are <clears throat> because the higher education sector is so diverse and ranges from small providers like the one you mentioned through to large multi-faculty um, universities operating across the globe. So what we're asking you to tell us is what your governance arrangements are and how you know that they're appropriate and effective. So my expectation would be that there will be providers who are registered, who will have a management team of two people, um, and that those governance management arrangements are perfectly acceptable given the num number of students they teach. Um, however, should a larger provider um, seek to demonstrate that such uh, governance arrangements were appropriate, it may be that we challenge more in relation to those providers. So if you are unsure, um, that's exactly the kind of thing that we're here to answer questions on and a really good thing to bring to a surgery because we can have a look at the details of your organization. Um, but the kind of the primary message is that the purpose of the self-assessment is for you to tell us how you know that your arrangements are appropriate and effective. And our strong expectation, as Becky said at the start of uh, the webinar, is that all providers will be honest triers and institutions who are seeking to deliver um, both compliance with the regulatory framework, but more importantly, um, good outcomes for students, and you will have given consideration to whether your own governing arrangements are appropriate or not. Um, so please just talk to us about that in your self-assessment. Great, so you, you mentioned there, uh, Jack, uh, surgeries. Um, so just to follow up with a question about that that we've been asked, are there any surgeries organised for those that were formerly known as alternative providers? The surgeries are open to all providers, so anyone interested in registering with the um, OFS, um, please let us know if you would like to book in a slot at those. Um, we are also looking at putting on some kind of tailored events, um, reflecting on kind of previous provider type, and details of those will be on our website shortly. And as part of this process, we are capturing all of the requests that come in, all of the questions that you have. And um, part of what we're trying to do is make sure that we put on um, the support events that are useful to providers. So if we, got, if we saw a lot of questions from alternative providers about a particular topic, it may be that we think the best way to address that is a specific event, so we can put that on in the future. So um, that's partly to encourage people to ask us the questions, because then we know what to put on. That's great. Um, we're getting close to the end of our session here, and it feels that that's possibly the best place to finish. We do have more questions, but unfortunately we don't have time to go through them. 
Um, so we will have a list of all the questions recorded in, in our system and those that we haven't been able to answer, we will have a list of, of who has asked them. And if they're quite specific or quite technical, we'll be able to come back to them separately by email, I think. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think that's all that's left to say then is thank you for joining the webinar today. We hope you found it useful. Um, we have just put our email address up on the slide one more time and a link to all the key documents. Um, and as we've mentioned several times, we do want to um, be in touch with you. Please pick up the phone and email us, um, and we'll make sure that the questions from today are available. Um, but if you um, do have anything else, please get in touch with us. Um, thank you once again. This is the end of today's webinar.